Hey everyone, it's Steve Cronin, and today I'm going to do something a little different. So far, generally on this channel, I've been reviewing nootropics, smart drugs, uh, and supplements. Uh, and I've done a little bit of uh, tech as well. All under the umbrella of the quantified self movement, or within the context of quantified self. But I realized as I was planning some of the tech videos, um, upcoming ones regarding some binaural beats, brainwave entrainment, uh, flashing LED glasses, um, heart math, I realized that it's time to do some philosophy. Just a little bit. Um, and I, when I say a little bit, I mean like four or five videos. <laughs> uh, feel free to skip them, right? Um, because at least with the at least with the brainwave entrainment stuff, maybe not so much the heart math stuff. And come to think of it, maybe I'll go ahead and record a heart math video. Maybe not before y'all see this. We'll see. Um, but before we get to the tech stuff, there's some actually pretty foundational belief structures that I somewhat adhere myself to, or at least am sympathetic to, um, in terms of a, like, what is reality standpoint that I think need to at least be expressed, um, and maybe need is a wrong word, like, at least, like, not need to be expressed, but I feel like you guys should have the opportunity to receive. Like I said, you can skip over this if you don't find it interesting. Um, this video is probably going to be, well, it is part one of what's probably going to be a four or five video series, um, which is within the context of quantified self. Uh, and it's revolving around integral theory. And it's revolving around the individual responsible for generating integral theory, and his name is Ken Wilber. All of those books you saw in the intro were all books either authored by or about Ken Wilber or his theories. So, and then this is like the most introductory Ken Wilber book you can buy on the market today, uh, which is called The Integral Vision. Which is kind of weird, because at the same time, I don't recommend anyone start their Ken Wilber journey with this book. Only because, uh, and, and I preface this by saying I think Ken Wilber is probably the smartest individual alive. Um, which, is, which is a huge thing to say. Um, but this book is marketed as, like, it's very new agey in its stuff. And new age type books aren't necessarily bad. Like, I don't think they're bad, but I think that uh, marketing integral theory as like a new age style book or using new age style lingo or like new age type images, I think is generally not a good way to express it. And I'm not saying that Ken is necessarily wrong in doing this. Maybe he didn't have any involvement in the pictures and the way this information was done. Like, I'm not sure, like Ken's a mysterious guy. Uh, also, like, there's a whole, like, integral, there's, well, not a whole integral, there's several integral theory communities out there. Uh, one of them I'm a part of called integrallife.com, which Ken Wilbur interacts with quite frequently, um, and maybe they had some input with this. Uh, more recently, there was, uh, an audio kind of form of an introduction to his work that came out, I think it started in 2014, called the Superhuman Operating System. And that one I do know for sure that Ken was involved in its inception and its marketing. And it was definitely not marketed as a new age stuff, but it was market marketed as kind of like a, an interesting take on spirituality that generally you don't get from his earlier work. Now this guy's been writing since I believe the early 80s. I was born in 1987, so this guy's been writing about things like way before like I was born. And by way before, I mean like what, like five years? <laughs> but still, like, that's a long time. So, um, now this particular book was written in 2007. I didn't, I started reading, actually, Ken Wilber in 2005. I didn't come across this until maybe 2012. I skimmed through it. I mean, like, it's a book with pictures, um, 
Like, it's not... Like, though you have important, like, terms bolded within paragraphs. It's a very, like, small... It's not a pocket-sized book, but it's, it's a, like, an oddly... Well, it's not a paperback size either. It's slightly bigger than a paperback size book. I don't even know if people really read books anymore. Like, I have most of my stuff in my Kindle. Like, that shelf and, like, two more are all I have. Most of my books have gotten rid of, but... Anyway, uh, integral theory, I think, is important to understanding quantified self-movement which I see as a reinterpretation of the human potential movement, which Ken Wilber himself was a huge inspiration to, and people within the human potential movement, like Mike Murphy, uh, did some amazing work with Ken Wilber. So this is stuff I think that we should all talk about. Integral theory, and let's pause again here. <laughs> There are degree, you can get like a master's degree in integral theory uh, from JFK University, as far as I understand. They may have discontinued the program, but at least at one point in time, you could get a master's degree in this stuff. Um, so there are people out there, like I'm an integral theory enthusiast. Um, that's actually, if you follow me on Twitter, at Steve Cronin, uh, in my bio, at least as of the time of this recording, in my bio, it says integral theory enthusiast. I am by no means an expert on this. I am by no means like adept at this material. Um, I feel like I can speak of it in generalities without making gross errors. However, I am definitely prone to making small errors. And uh, But I think I know enough, because I've been reading about this stuff since 2007, I think I know enough to uh, be able to communicate some very basic ideas. So that being said, integral theory rests upon the idea that every perspective that a human being can take in the world is not 100% right. So no one book is 100% right, including the Bible, according to integral theory. Because why? Well, because the Bible is written by people, or a person or people, right? People. <laughs> um, no one artistic expression is 100% correct. And when I, what I mean by 100% correct is represent, representative of truth, okay? Whatever that is, I don't know what that is. Um, this video that I'm making right now is not 100% true. Interval theory is not 100% true. So conversely, right, No one perspective is 100% wrong. Integral theory is not 100% wrong. This video is not going to be 100% wrong. You're not, as Ken Wilber says, you're not smart enough to be 100% wrong all the time. So even the perspectives that we find most, like, distasteful and perspectives that we think are just flat-out offensive Maybe, according to integral theory, there is, but maybe there is like a nugget of truth in there. Maybe there's a part of that perspective that's important to who we are as human beings and to who we are as a species and to what the universe is. And if you accept that premise, and you don't have to, and that's totally cool. I don't even know if I do, but I'm, sim I'm very sympathetic to it. So if you accept that premise, then suddenly it becomes very hard to attach yourself to an idea or attach yourself, an idea could be like, attach yourself to a political philosophy, attach yourself to a religious tradition, um, attach yourself to uh, like science, the scientific method, right? It, it becomes hard to attach yourself to one system and commit to it 100% because now you have a realization that that system is only partially true. And the idea behind integral theory is integral theory attempts to look at all the systems that have ever existed, which it hasn't done, right? Because there's not enough people spending time on this to do it. But integral theory tries to look at systems all of them that have ever existed, all of them that will come into being and that will exist, and take 
the most important pieces from them. And who decides what's most important? That's a good question. Well, A, if you accept the premise of integral theory, probably what you're going to do is get rid of absolute statements. So if there's an absolute statement in the Bible, like in the New Testament, if it says Jesus is the only way to salvation after death, that's probably something integral theory is going to remove, right? Because then no longer is the premise of integral theory true, which is that no perspective is 100% correct. Now, I am not saying that integral theory is true. I have no idea. Maybe, like I'm actually, I'm very agnostic towards integral theory. Like I'm sympathetic to it. It makes a lot of sense to me. But I'm not about to rise up and be like, this is truth. This is what everyone should follow. I just think that it's very interesting. And I think out of all the philosophies that I've encountered, it's one I resonate with most. Um, so dogma becomes an issue. Absolute statements become an issue. So when you're looking at different systems of belief, those tend to go out the window as being like important. So what is important? Well, another thing that integral theory is all about in terms of like its foundation is inclusiveness, right? By the very nature of not being 100% correct and not being 100% wrong, you have like, and this is not a Venn diagram, but this is like a bunch of circles. <laughs> I don't know how this would map out, but everyone kind of overlaps a little bit, right? So what's important? Well, maybe it's defined as uh, consistency. If we are just gonna look at religious traditions from the perspective of integral theory, then we're going to look at consistent ideas and consistent philosophies throughout those religious traditions. So we're going to throw out the absolute statements. And now we're going to look for, okay, what do Christians believe in? That Buddhists also believe in? That Hindus also believe in? That followers of Islam also believe in? Etc. And then we're going to go from there. And there are people who spend their entire lives on a very small issue, on a very small, like, religious tradition, and try to fit it in the map that is integral theory. It's complicated stuff. When you really, like, integral theory itself, I don't think is very complex, because essentially it's just the ideas that I've outlined, in my opinion, and from, from what I can gather from these books that I've read. But at the same time, the ramifications are pretty intense, and the ramifications get really complicated and messy. So there is a graphic that is uh, mostly uh, associated, or commonly associated with integral theory, and it is called the four quadrants. This is a, uh, this is a graphic invented by Ken Wilber. It was unveiled in his book, Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality, which I believe was written in the early 90s, of which I have only read about a half of because it is a monstrosity. <laughs> and this is, that, this is that graphic right here. The four quadrants represent the four perspectives, the four major perspectives, the idea being that there are more than four, but the four major perspectives of the world. And they're represented by the pronouns I, we, it, and its. And as you can see, we have an upper left quadrant, an upper right quadrant, a lower left quadrant, and a lower right quadrant. I, it, we, its. Upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right. So the idea of the four major perspectives is hey if we're going to we're going to say that everyone is not 100% correct or that's an absolute statement right <laughs> so it's likely that not everyone's 100% correct and it's likely that not everyone is 100% wrong and we're all about inclusivity well how should we look at things and Ken Wilber said hey like let's look at things through these four major perspectives and generally like people seem to agree with this, or at least uh, people who are followers of integral theory uh, and, uh, you know, like uh, transpersonal psychology, for example, seem to agree with this. 
So we'll start with the upper left quadrant, which is the I quadrant. What I recommend, um, if you're into this stuff at all, and if you haven't stopped the video already, is to uh, just go ahead and Google image search uh, four quadrants Ken Wilber. And, and some version of this will come up. Uh, so the upper left quadrant is represented by the pronoun I. Okay. And the upper left is an interior, meaning something that is not measurable. And you might say, well, interior stuff is measurable, like inside of my body is measurable. Well, by interior, Ken Wilber means something like your thoughts. How do you measure thoughts? And you might say, well, thoughts are electrochemical activity in the brain. We can measure thought. Well, not really, right? Like, if I'm depressed and you hook up machines to my head, you might see measurements that are correlated with feelings of depression. But you're not gonna you're not gonna look at these measurements and internally, intrinsically feel the depression. You're just gonna see the measurements. You're gonna see the objective data. You're not gonna have the subjective feeling. And that's another word for the upper left quadrant is subjective. So it's subjective, it's used I, like with the pronoun I, so I feel usually, like I feel depressed. What does a measurement look like for depression? I don't, like, beyond that correlation, I don't know, okay? So I feel depressed. I feel happy. Subjectivity. Um, something like beauty fits in here. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's a subjective kind of quality, right? Um, art, right? It's subjective. I like it. I don't like it. <laughs> just, just like that, okay? It's all about perspectives. Okay, upper right quadrant. Now we're in the objective realm. Okay, this is like the realm of science. This is what I was talking about earlier when I said, well, how do you measure thought? And someone might say, oh, you can measure it because it's electrochemical activity in the brain and we can put an EEG on you and we can, we can get, we can, you have a high alpha right now. And okay, so that's, that's stuff that's measurable. So that's the upper right. That's science. That's objective. So the pronoun for this perspective is it. So I can measure it, right? It is X or maybe more aptly stated, it appears X, right? So to me, this ball is like a yellowish green, right? That's actually more my subjective kind of sense of the color of this ball and color is a product of perception. So perhaps this is a, this is a poor choice. Um, but stuff does matter, right? Like I'm just, I put on these, orange tinted glasses and and my perception of the world is completely changed. Everything is has an orange hue to it. Right? So but the objective stuff is stuff that's measurable. And because some good examples are escaping me, I will uh, I will refer to this book. So the upper right quadrant is what any individual event looks like from the outside. This especially includes its physical behavior, its material components, its matter, energy, its concrete body. For all of those items that can be referred to in some sort of objective third person or it fashion, that is the upper right quadrant. So yeah, so those, uh, that alpha wave that we see with the EEG, which I have one, I'm gonna bust it out in a future video. It's gonna be awesome. But let's remember that the EEG cannot measure emotion. The EEG can likely measure something that correlates with a certain emotion or a certain brain state, a certain state of consciousness. That's going to be another video, states of consciousness. You hear people like Dave Asprey and Stephen Kotler talk about flow states. 
Well, what does that mean? Well, let's back up a little bit and talk about the philosophy first. And that's why I want to make this video about philosophy is because if we don't, we don't have to agree on philosophy, but if we don't understand where we're coming from in terms of what perspective I hold, what perspective Stephen Kotler holds, what perspective Chad Creighton holds, what perspective Dave Asprey holds, we're going to have some confusion with our terms and we're going to have disagreeing. You know, I'm, a, I'm an irregular listener of Bulletproof Radio, which is a podcast run by uh, Dave Asprey, a Bulletproof executive. And sometimes uh, there's some, you know, he says some things and I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of weird. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if all four quadrants are being taken into account when you make that statement. Taking all four perspectives into account means that you're being as inclusive as you can. And there are way more perspectives in the world than four, but these four major ones are a good start. And to be honest with you, it's nerdy enough to have four quadrants, right? Like, it's pretty nerdy. All right, so the next one, which is the, <laughs> which is the lower left, is we. We is all about inner subjectivity. This is you and me, right? This is two or more people gathered talking to each other, right? It's, it's, it's plural in the sense that there's more than one I involved, but it's intersubjective in the fact that it's still an interior. So we're not looking objectively at two people talking, but this is the experience that you and I would have if we sit down and have a conversation with each other. There's two eyes, I and you. I, this is you, I, I, right? This is where we get into territory regarding morals, morality, right? How should I treat you? How should you treat me? How should we treat each other? Um, this is what we decide, yeah, like what's good, what's bad. Again, I'm going to refer to the book. <laughs> Not an expert. <laughs> okay, here. So, every eye is in relationship with other eyes which means that every I is a member of numerous we's. These we's represent not just individual, but group or collective, not just subjective, but inner subjective awareness or culture in the broadest sense. This is represented in the lower left quadrant. Okay, so it's the interior experience of communing with others. This is the we. So, moving to the lower right, it's plural. The plural of the upper right quadrant is the lower right quadrant. It's is an exterior. And this is actually the example I gave before of what the lower left quadrant isn't. So if, I'm, if I fly down to Acapulco, Mexico, and I look at the culture, and I see people speaking languages, different languages, different variations of uh, Spanish, different dialects, different accents, different customs, different traditions, different ways of dressing, different ways of behaving, whole new culture from what I'm used to. And I'm seeing this, I'm looking at this at its exterior because I'm seeing it, I'm observing it. But that doesn't mean that I am subjectively aware of what's going through their minds as a culture. I don't know what it's like to be tapped into that culture unless I was like an anthropologist and lived among them for a long period of time, then I can tap into that it's space, that it plural space. All right, let's see what the book has to say here. It's social system and environment. For example, survival plans, ethnic tribes, feudal empires, corporate states, values, communities, commons, okay. Um, so, 
every Wii has an exterior, or what it looks like from the outside, and this is the lower right, quad lower right quadrant. The lower left is called a cultural dimension, uh, or the inside awareness of its worldview, its shared values, shared feelings, etc. The lower right is the social dim dim dimension, or the exterior forms of behaviors within the group, studied by third-person sciences. So, here's an easy way to look at this. The left side, these are interiors. This is the I subjective. I feel sad. This is an internal experience. This is the we inner subjective. We feel sad. Okay? Then this is the, uh, this side is the exterior. So this would be it, right? It is an alpha wave. And then it's would be uh, like maybe they, right? Because this is an exterior. So it would be like um, they speak Spanish. They have this particular custom. I see a bunch of people in Peru being led by a shaman on an ayahuasca ceremony. I don't know what that's like. I'm not in the we space. I'm not under the influence of ayahuasca and I'm not in that ceremony participating in it, but I'm observing it. So see how you, you go back and forth between interiors and exteriors when you're talking about perspective. And notice how you go from I to we. I and we, or looking at it and its. And those are the four major perspectives. And that is probably a good stopping place for this first video uh, on the philosophy. But, but, but here's kind of like what's to come, right? So um, I kind of mentioned this earlier. So we're going to bust out an EEG machine here. An EEG machine, uh, wow, awesome. Like, I wish I had one 10 years ago. Like, um, if we talk about a meditative state, right, certain meditative states might produce a combination of, like, alpha and theta waves. Certain meditation states might leave the brain with no measurable activity, right? You can slap on EEG, which will measure that electronic activity, um, but, or electric activity. Um, but that EEG readout is not going to give you the sense of the subjective experience of being in that meditative state, right? That's the difference between the upper left quadrant, or the I, and the upper right quadrant, the it what's being measured and what's being experienced. And when we're having this, these conversations about biohacking or taking something objective and measurable, it taking an aracetam, affecting my physiology in a certain way, and we're still in it territory, we're still in the upper right, and then now we're gonna transition, and then it makes me feel more focused, now we're in the I, just remember that I and it, the upper left and the upper right quadrant, tend to correlate to each other a lot. But don't equate the two. Don't reduce one to the other. Don't say that this is focus, right? Or that if you can measure the effects of this in my brain, that that measurement is focus, that change in electrochemical activity is focus. Because you don't know. You can only correlate the two. And to reduce one to the other, or to equate the two is, I suspect, a mistake. And it's something that interval theory would say is a mistake. Hey, if you're interested in reading up on this, I don't really know what to recommend to you um, because Ken's, Ken's books are so long and, and this, I think, is a very poor introduction to, to the subject. Um, so, gosh, like, if I would recommend something... I would do, hmm, okay, I would do integral psychology. That's your commitment level. It's a lot different than this, right? Um, this will give you an overview of integral theory and, uh, and actually gives an overview of integral theory, but yeah, it's all within the context of psychology. However, if I remember correctly, this book, Integral Spirituality, the entire first chapter is just on integral theory. 
and I remember it being pretty good. That's it. Right, so pick up Integral Spirituality and read the first 35 pages. It ends on this. Look familiar? Okay. Or go to a bookstore and read the first 35 pages, and if you want to read the breast, then buy it. Yeah, the first 35 pages outlines Integral Theory pretty well in this book, Integral Spirituality. Um, yeah, Integral Psych is uh, it's too contextualized, in my opinion. I mean, it's amazing stuff, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's very contextualized from a psychological perspective. Um, so that's it for now. This video, I don't know, I guess I'll call it an introduction to Integral Theory. And, uh, you know, I hope you stick around for at least one or two more um, of these videos, but I, I suspect that the second video, the second philosophy video, we're going to go into some human development stuff, which is super important for the, um, for the biohacking and the quantified self movement. The second video is going to take off. I might preface, I might record again for the preface, record the preface of this video again, I mean, and, and then say, if this is too boring, skip it and go to, and go to video number two, or maybe I'll start with video two. <laughs> take care guys.